I know this fellow, this bloke came up to me and wanted some help. He was, he was a bit nervous and anxious and he asked for help. He, he wanted some food. He, he said his money had run out and there was another week before he got money in. Could we help him out with food? I said, sure. So I took him around, we got some bags of food, groceries to keep him over for the, for the next week or two. We talked a little, didn't get much from him, just that he needed some support and he was grateful. A couple of weeks later he was back and said a bit nervously and, and embarrassed I guess, could he have some more help? The food was great and it was really helpful. He was really low on funds, could he get some more? And this happened a number of times and, and gradually I got more and more of his story. He, he was a, a fellow, not that, not that old, 30ish probably, I mean, maybe early 30s. He lived with mental illness, schizophrenia, and he had, he had a dual diagnosis, not only the schizophrenia, but a drug addiction. And he'd been a drug addict, and he was, he was off the drugs, the hard stuff, and on a methadone program. He lived in a, a bed sit in a local community, in a poorer part. And I guess he was filled with some sense of shame. Not as good as other people. He couldn't think in the same way or hold down the jobs that other people. He didn't have a nice home and all the stuff that went in it. It was just him and he was a drug addict. And, and as, as he engaged more and more and he joined in some of our groups, he was accepted. People weren't sure of him. I mean, he's a big guy and he's a bit gruff and he, he was very wary and defensive and anxious. But when he let his defences down a little bit and began to trust people, there was a nice side to him. And, and I remember the, the time, the first time he, he laughed with us. Not, not in a self-deprecating way, laughing at himself or putting himself or someone else down, but laughing with us. And then others, particularly young adults, laughing with him at jokes he told. Not at him, as others had done. And he, he began to be embraced. He was always a bit different, quite different. He, was a, he kept to himself a lot. He was an isolated sort of bloke, lonely. But he found a place where he could kind of belong. And, and I could see these changes in him as he began to trust people and believe he fitted in just a little bit. And he began to change. And, and I, I'm thinking this, he, he began to see himself in a better way. And I remember going, going to his place, being invited to his place, and going into his simple bed sit, and him showing me around some of the things he had in there, with, with some sense of pride that these were his, and I wasn't going to look down on him. And him offering me a cup of coffee giving something back, uh, of going with him when he went to the psych hospital to, to see the you know, one-stop shop, to see the social workers, the psychologists, the doctors, to get prescriptions and support and help and make sure he was on the right path, of walking with him on that day, of going into his world a little bit and mixing with the people he mixed with, of understanding his world and accepting him in it. I thought of this story this week when I read the story of Jesus from Luke. Jesus crosses over to the other side of the lake. He and the disciples cross over from, from the side which is, gen, which is Jewish, clean, good, safe, secure, comfortable, to the Gentile pagan side, the side that's unclean, the place where Jews only go when they have to go. Jesus crossed over and, and he, he went and met this man and this man was in a cemetery, the place of the dead, the place where, again, Jews don't go unless it's to bury their dead. It's unclean. And there is this man, this man who is unclean, this man who is isolated, this man who is sick in his mind, his being. This man who is chained up and locked away from the world, 
perhaps the scapegoat of the local city, the, the, the one that people pour out of their anxieties and their frustrations and their hatred and their judgment on. He, he lived in this cemetery and he did himself harm and he cried out day and night. And people said he was out of his mind, he was mad, he was possessed by demons. And Jesus goes up and touches him, embraces him into his world. He goes into this man's world and connects. And he talks. And there's this military language in the story. Jesus understands this man to be demon possessed and, and says to the demons, commands the demons, tell me who you are, what is your name? The man himself has no name in the story. He's man, male, demon possessed, mad, strange, weirdo, crazy guy on the mountain, the guy who lives amongst the dead. They're his names. And Jesus asks these demons, what is your name? And they say, Legion, which is a military image for a Roman group of soldiers, four to five thousand. And he commands them to go out of this man. And they beg him to put them into this herd of swine, pigs. Again, a military image because the boar was the, the symbol of one of these Roman legions. And the, 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 these, these demons go out into the pigs and they run down the hillside into the lake and they're drowned. Chen Myers, when he's talking about Mark's version of this story, talks about the personal and the political. And the personal is the man's personal oppression, the man's own struggle. The man's struggle in life, his oppression, his isolation, his judgment, his, his oppression of body, mind and spirit. The political is the oppression of the community, of the world in which he lives, other people. And for these people in this part of the world, on the edge of the Roman Empire, where there are Roman armies situated, the experience of the oppression of the Roman Empire is real that it's good stuff with Rome. They brought in, in road, built roads and aqueducts to get their armies and that to the edges. The army there protects people, but it comes at great cost. Cost of freedom and high taxation, and it's hard. And there's oppression. And as these pigs run down and run into the sea, other stories of the Jewish mind are remind, uh, come to come to mind. When Moses led the people out of Egypt, slaves in Egypt, out of oppression, they were confronted by the Red Sea on one hand and the army of Egypt, the oppressive army, coming after them. And Moses is told to touch the lake with his staff, the sea, and it parts and the people go across. And when they all get across, he touches it again. And the seas consume the armies of Egypt. And I guess what, what Luke is trying to say is that in Jesus, God is the one who brings liberation from oppression. The oppressive forces on a person and the oppressive forces on the world. That this way of God is about liberation and transformation and new life. And the man himself, in being touched, in being embraced, in being treated as a human being, is given now the maybe not the name, but the categorization of human being. He is a person, he is a human being. He is real. And he restores to his right mind and he lives in community. He belongs. Jesus reaches out to the other, to the person who is different, goes into the place, crosses into the place that is, that is uncomfortable and unclean and embraces the one who is different brings transformation, liberation and life. And, and that's the promise of God for us all. And I, I guess that's what this, this friend of mine experienced, Daryl. Isolated, alone, judged, excluded, lost. He came in and found a community to belong to. He came in and was welcomed. He came in and was valued trusted and gain trust in others and he himself began the process of transformation it, it started within him and he changed 
This is the story that Jesus invites us into. To reach out into the world to the other person, to cross over into the world of the other person with love. And in that love, to offer the transformation, the liberation of God. Because that's what God is all about. Bringing hope and life to all people.